Hey everyone, welcome to the CyberHub Engage podcast. I am your host and my name is James Azar. I want to thank you for tuning in to our podcast. And if this is your first episode ever, the CyberHub Engage podcast is all about cybersecurity, smart cities, IOTs, like today's episode. We're going to be talking to Mr. Paul Wirtz. Um, and he's a subject matter expert in all things, you know, smart cities worked on some of the very few Air Force smart base projects that are now been implemented. And so it's going to be a very, very exciting episode. I want to thank you for tuning in. Um, CyberHub Engage is brought to you by CyberHub Academy. Um, check out their website, cyberhubacademy.com. Um, and they're a complete solution for cybersecurity training for any size organization, um, anywhere from 25 million to a billion in annual revenue and take care of all your security needs with the world-class trainers and all the other good stuff. So I want to thank them for sponsoring today's episode. Again, that's cyberhubacademy.com. And we're going to be right back with Paul Wirtz and the Cyber Hub Engage podcast. Thank you. So I kind of wanted to start off our conversation a little bit more on the um, on the smart city aspect, right? Mm-hmm. So whenever you hear smart cities, people say, oh, look at Dubai, look at Singapore. And I know you're not too familiar with those, but those were built from scratch. So the playing field isn't as fair as trying to take our infrastructure in this country and turn it into a smart city infrastructure because the challenges are far greater. How do you overcome those, in your opinion? Well, it's, it's not always as bad as it sounds, right? So right. there are cities, um, Dubai, Singapore, there's also Guangdong in China right. that was going to be like a, a smart city built from scratch. Uh, you you have growing pains associated with that when you, you know, it's just like when you buy any kind of new piece of technology, are people going to use it as much? Um, in, in much of the world, when you're looking at a smart city, it tends to be focused a little bit differently than it does in America. So uh, maybe it's resource constraints, um, access to water, access to power, um, things like that. In America, we tend to be a little bit more spoiled about things. What is traffic going to be like? Uh, am I going to be able to um, have access to some information for events or things? Uh, so a lot of it is what your goal is and then where you start, but you see in, in like telephony where, you know, some places that don't have the traditional installed wireline telephony, they have wireless now. So are right. their capabilities really worse off? Or in some cases, they might be better because they've got newer technology. So I don't necessarily think that that puts you behind. I think it's more of a focus thing. And you know we don't necessarily have a good focus always in America on stuff. So you know when you look at what's going on with smart cities, a lot of it, it tends to be they've got one project they're going to call smart city. And uh, that project is a success, but then they don't know where to go from there um, because they were trying to solve a real problem, which is not a bad thing, but just because you solve one problem doesn't make you a smart city. So a smart city is more about a way of thinking, more about opening that data up so that people can access it, they can solve problems um, a, a community-wide for all of the constituents that you have, your citizens, your students, your em- employers, employees, um, the public safety uh, infrastructure that you've got in place. Um, visitors like in Atlanta, you, you've got you know a tremendous influx of people that come into the city to work every day. Um, you know, normally those wouldn't be considered citizens, but right. they are a very part of what makes up. You know, when you're looking at what Atlanta's doing, um, they're part of the problem. So you've got to help address them as well. Well, I, I mean, Atlanta right? has a lot of different problems. Traffic yeah. for yeah. one, securing City Hall another. Um, yeah. You know, and we won't go down that road. We've, right. we, we've, you know, it's, it's, you know, you, everyone's always said, I told them so, I told them so, I told them so, right? But the real challenge in smart cities, I think, and, and from one of the things I've seen is, so we have all this great technology, right? And you have, I want to call them the, um, the grandfathered companies that are, that have built this infrastructure, right? That have helped get power and water and electricity and and telecommunication and so forth into different cities. 
when you look at smart cities in in other places in the world and 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 really the the big two examples are always dubai and singapore right, right, right. i've worked on the dubai piece for a little while and 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 i kind of studied the singapore piece a little bit more right and um again those were kind of you know dubai not the whole city is a smart city in fact it's only five different zones within right. dubai you know it's dubai internet city dubai media city dubai knowledge village um they had a good focus you know well, and, but but none of those cities are really interconnected yeah. either, right? So, I mean, you kind of have, oh, well, they're all kind of smart cities, but really what's smart about them? And most right. of the time it's just, oh, the government's way of establishing things. You can open a company in Dubai Media City online without ever stepping foot into the building. Um, putting in a visa card and, and so run it and you're, you're... Was their goal to bring in revenue? Yeah, was their goal to bring in revenue? Like Estonia? You know, yeah. Estonia has a really good kind of government smart process where that you know you can you can get your residency online. You don't even have to be in Estonia to get right. your residency, right? right. And, and and that came about a lot of times because their infrastructure was built later than everybody else. When when you look at legacy companies or legacy infrastructures like cities and stuff, they're doing things that way a lot of times because that's the way they've been doing them forever. And right. to change it is really really painful. Um, I mean, you, you, you see this with the president now going and trying to do wholesale changes to systems. Is, well, he's is trying to do a business change to a government organization. Right. right. And I think, you know, a lot of times he's using that, you know, New York uh, swagger right. um, and, um, and and that, that New York swagger is always so in, yeah. in, in people's head. And a lot of that is perception, though, right? Yeah. So, well, and that gets into like when you're talking about smart cities. Um, what is the real goal? So is, is the goal to really change the way a city operates or is the goal to have um, revenue for patronage that you can you know, dole that stuff to your friends or is it to generate a lot of marketing because you can read articles about how good cities are doing and when you peel the level back and you see, well, it isn't really changing that city, um, they're just getting good press. Uh, so there, you know, there, there is a lot of different things that are going on in the smart city space and in my my idea or my belief is that you really want to change the way people live in the city. You really want to have an impact on uh, you know travel time, access to information, um, integration of resources in a way that things become possible that maybe they weren't before. You kind of started an initiative, you know, smart bases and so forth, right? Kind of trying to take something away from you know, trying to change something very simple. Like, hey, let's go and do this really good and then sure. be really good at this. What was your thought process behind that? I mean, what was the, the motive behind doing that? And I know there's some stuff we can't disclose, but what you can share with us. Sure. So we had an idea. We approached um, the, the Air Force about, uh, about doing uh, some changes to the way that they currently did uh, some base operations. Um, and, you know, generally when you're looking at uh, uh, the stuff that we approach them with, it was more about augmenting what they're already doing. Like I said, when we work in sec with security forces, we we're providing some perimeter uh, 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 alarming capabilities and some video capabilities so that they could see more and do more so they could deploy sources, resources in a more appropriate manner. So not only do you know... Um, something is happening. If you have a video, you know what is happening. So rather than deploying one guy, maybe you deploy more than one guy. Um, you, you know, when you're looking in public safety, knowing what you're responding to is very key. Um, you know, we've all read about like domestic disputes being very, you know, a, a high chance of, 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 of violence. violence happening. So when, when a police officer responds to something like that, they're more likely to respond with more force than just one guy showing up. And it's the same thing. When you're looking at a military base, you know, in, in, in some cases, you actually do have things that are happening that need to be addressed. Um, and, and a lot of times, because there are bases um, where there's people living on the base, there are schools on the base, and there are different things, you, you have a lot of false flags where something might happen where, you, you know, in, in a normal situation, you would say, oh, this is really dangerous, but it could just be a kid playing. So the sooner you can identify something or the sooner you can positively eliminate something, then the more you can go about what your day-to-day -day duties really are. And you stay focused. And so you're, 
th this was a really cool project. I mean, when I met you, you the first time, you, you know, when we met at the, uh, at the at the wireless, I think it was women and what is it, women? What? There's a wireless technology forum. We're a wireless technology forum. That's right. They I, do have a women's thing that they've recently launched, but we're not invited. Yeah, we're we're men. Yeah, we're not allowed in. No men allowed. Not even on a bad day. That's horrible. I mean, can <laughs> I mean, all power to women and women organization and women empowerment. I still think that, you know. We should all be a part. We should all be together. I, I will tell you this. So I've got five daughters, and it is nice to be able to have for them someplace to go. Patricia is working on some stuff with Girl right. Scouts. All of my girls have been in Girl Scouts, and um, Caroline Dunn, who's also Wireless Technology Forum, has uh, done. She's got actually stuff online where you can have a, do like skills with Alexa. Oh, very um, cool. And it's it's very, if you haven't looked it up, it's very well worth looking up. Um, Raina Lingo, another lady that I was working with at TAG, um, her and I participated in a hackathon a couple of weeks ago. Um, and um, so I just find ways to work with them outside of the women. And, you know, how, how do you, you know, you just mentioned something about Alexa and IoT. How does IoT play into the whole smart city? I mean, obviously, you know, most people think that they're separate, but really, I mean, in my mind, IoT is the engine, the civilian engine of a smart city. Is it not? So it, it's really funny. So, you know, I, IoT, the Internet of Things, has kind of evolved over the years. Um, if you've been doing this for a while, you were familiar with the term machine to machine or right. SCADA. Um, um, and, and now you even see an IoT have like the IoT, the Industrial Internet of Things, where you might have it doing uh, machinery and stuff. But um, what you really see is that over time, things that are wireless have become more accepted and more pervasive on the network. So um, when I first got involved with wireless a few years, it's been 24 years ago, you, you had to actually request a cell phone. It wasn't given to you, you know, when you came to work at a company. A laptop was not given to you. You had a desktop computer and a desktop phone. Well, nowadays the model's been kind of turned around. If you need a desktop computer, that's a different kind of purchase because everybody gets laptops <laughs> and cell phones are so easy. So if you run an IT network, um, do you want to have to come out and plug everybody in every time there's a new employee coming or do you just give them the, the, the wireless key? You know, so it, your, your network is becoming more um, easier to manage in some ways. It's, it's, you know, there's some issues with people accessing it that shouldn't. But, um, you know, when you look at it from that point of view, We've now expanded the network to include all these wireless devices, sensors and devices. Um, you can even see um, in, in some areas, you know, like in, there's some news recently about, you know, people having their Fitbit stuff tracked around the world. And, and so right. even when it's wireless, that stuff at some point in time is going to hit a network somewhere that's going to be aggregated into data that's useful to somebody. So... Um, you have to know what you're doing with the data. You have to know who has access to it. But then you also have to use it yourself. We have so many, so much data. Um, I was at a, a, a Smart Cities Forum a, a year or so ago, and one of the speakers there was saying, we need to quit collecting data. We need to start using the data that we have, which is a really good point because we are now swimming in data, and we're, everything that we've got today gives us data. And, you know, even, you know, the newer cars are putting out Data, data, data is money for a lot of people, right? I mean, that's why hackers hack. Right. That's but why so security is security. Hackers hack for, they, they're looking for stuff that can turn into money. Right, right but data so, is money. But a lot of people are saving data because they're afraid they might be missing something, but it's, it's just like hoarders, right? So you've got all this stuff, but you, you at some Did point Did you just time, say hoarders of data? Yeah, there, there are. You know, is that is that like a new term? We need be. to Google that. Hang on, I'm gonna write this down. Hoarders of data. That is brilliant. When, when you look at, um, <laughs> and, and actually, you know, when we talked with the Air Force about this, they were concerned about it too because you see uh, companies that will go to police forces and say, if you use our services, storage will give you the devices data. to take. We'll give you the cameras to to store. So. They're basically giving you this, and, and one of the guys at the Air Force said this is kind of like crack, right? They give it to you a little bit, and you just go well, on. Well, they hey, take a yeah. sample. Right. But the problem with it is, is you've got to have policies on yeah. what to do with the data. How long do you keep the data? Who has access to the data? Where is it stored? Because um, if you don't have a policy, it'll just get bigger and bigger and bigger. 
Um, back in the old days when I was a paramedic, they had tapes in the 911 center. So you'd have a tape that would record for 24 hours, and you kept those tapes for 30 days. If there wasn't a legal challenge or something, that tape got reused, and the data was gone. Okay, so th that was a limitation of resources. You only had we only had like 40 tapes. So you, you know, if, you got, <laughs> if you had a lot of law or, or legal issues, there wasn't you know s so many resources. But now with data, you can just keep it. But then you're going to have people that are just fishing for stuff. And that's not just necessarily cyber people. It might be lawsuits. It might be a disgruntled employee. They have the ability to go after data that you've got out there. And a lot of times, if you're not using it, you don't know what's there. So it's really incumbent upon you to, to say, what resources do I really need to keep and how do I want to use it? And that's where a lot of smart city stuff is. So they, they've got this data. Put it out there and let people... You know, they, they do hackathons and they do different stuff, but there also just might be private citizens out there that say, I got a good idea. Let me see what I can do. Well, I mean, obviously hackers hack data. They're trying to make money on it. Right. You know, if fact is, I think in, in a lot of the reports I've seen recently um, and, and out of personal knowledge, most hackers are businesses. And so obtaining data allows them to create reports, which they can then sell for right. a lot of money to people who really want it. Hacking Fitbit data and then saying, wait a minute, all Americans have an average heart rate of 112, and by the way, if we want to kill them all and, you know, get their heart rate to 180. Feed them more fried chicken. Yeah, feed them yeah. more fried chicken, you know. Bring, well, bring them down south and have them have a pecan pie. But a lot of times when you're looking at a, a hacker, um, and this is why, you know, like say a hackathon is out there, um, they're bringing people in that look data from a different way. So... Um, if, if I'm a hacker out there looking at, say, Fitbit data, um, I might be able to glean location, I might be able to glean times of activity, or even forms of activity that I could use for nefarious purposes. So, you know, w one of the products that I developed a long time ago was a patient safety institute that developed the first kind of uh, HIPAA compliant product that allowed doctors to access data, and this was back on a Palm device. Um, so they could actually see patients' uh, lab reports and stuff, and it was all compliant. When you look over time, like patient identifiable information, use, or personal identifiable information, used to be considered things like your date of birth, your name, your address, social security number. Well, if you have access to a ton of data, and you can reverse engineer stuff, it might be a guy that has a certain blood type that lives in a zip code and is of a certain age. If you can zero it down into one guy, because you have access to all that data, and, and, and this is what, what hackers really do, is they look at data from a point of view to how can I get to that one person or what can I do to narrow it down. And, and so when, when you have information out there, you have to be cognizant of that. Um, look at... That's a great point of view, though. It, 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 but you see that with... Right. Um, actually, with, with most technologies, they, they're rarely used for what they were originally intended. We, we have this kind of ability to expand and bastardize stuff. So... Um, you look at the um, the DDoS stuff with the routers a year or two ago, where somebody just found out that we all leave our passwords the same, and, and so they can go in and they can have our um, routers become little bots on the network that just brings things out. Um, it, I don't know if you're, are you familiar with 2600? No. So there's a hacker's uh, quarterly magazine out there. Really? You should read it sometime. It's pretty <laughs> fascinating. Um, 2600 is the frequency that was used back in the 60s for long distance calls. And if you had a whistle that could whistle the tone before computers, you could actually get free long distance calls. <laughs> um, so that's the original hacking, hacking the well, phones? The really funny thing is that back in the 60s, Captain Crunch gave a whistle that happened to blow at 2600. No. Um, so there's a, and so that's the, the legend. Captain like Crunch that, yeah. was a hacker? Well, it, it wasn't on purpose. <laughs> Captain but Crunch. People found that out and they were able to find out that uh, they could, you know, make. But there are other ways around. There are, um, you know, one, there, are, there are ways to pass information without people knowing about it, right? Right. We're, we're way off of smart cities, but. Um, well, no, I mean, this is cyber, we, do, we do talk a lot about cybersecurity here. I mean, that's pretty much the, the concept I kind of wanted to, you know, when you worked on this. So, so let, me, let, me, let me kind of bring this back real fast because okay. this is a, 
way funner conversation, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in in telecom, right, and and having your background be, you know, in, in telecom slightly, cyber threats, is it is it just as easy as getting to an antenna? No. Or 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 you know, kind of one of the the motherboard, not the so, motherboards, the. So uh, you know, it's, I mean, so you look at it from different ways, right? So um, when you're looking at accessing, say, when we're looking at say the smart base or, or even smart cities, um, do I have access to the data? So can access be denied? So are, is you know in America it's illegal to block a cellular network, um, and, and so but there are devices out there that will block a network. You see them trying; they're trying to use them in some prisons and stuff for people to bring in cell phones. Contraband, yeah. But even some of the uh, the Wi-Fi standards out there, I can bring a Wi-Fi network down, um, or I can slow everybody on it down, um, and then you can kind of control the tempo of what's going on. So. Having access to that data is the first kind of step in that. Is is the access good? And this is really where, when you're looking at a smart city, um, the Navy has a term called integrated fire. So the idea is that I'm on a vessel, and I have to shoot a target that I can't see. Um, how many sources of information can I give that give me a reliable pinpoint on that location? Is it three, four, ten, twelve? You know, who knows? But I want to get as much information as I can from as many sources that I can because some of them may be compromised. So I want to be able to take the aggregate knowledge and be able to shoot something with full confidence. So, you know, that Navy concept of integrated fire is something you can look at here when we're looking at the security aspect of stuff. Do I have an alarm going off? Do I have a video of the aspect? Do I have feet on the ground? Do I have, you know, bystanders calling in? Are there other alarms going off? Because you've got multiple things that might be going off. Uh, and, and so that's the first kind of thing, right? So it, do I have information coming in and what can I do with it? Um, the, the second piece is, has that data been compromised? Um, is somebody sending me fake video or is somebody sending me false alarms? And those are things that you need to attend to when you're building in the security of your system, whether you've got a dashboard that can validate that then there are federal standards for security. Um, not that's not my depth of knowledge I'm aware of them but they are um, things that you attend to but then you also have you know this uh, chaos engineering right um, where it's the idea where somebody might test how you how you mess things up how and and you know back to my paramedic days we used to do disaster drills where you would say okay there's been a plane crash on like poncho train you got 40 patients out there and, and the, you would call the local volunteer fire department, you'd call the Coast Guard, you'd call the Sheriff's Office, you'd call the various different agencies that would respond to any kind of large, and you see what happens. And, and what happens a lot of times is people do things they don't normally do, people use equipment they don't normally see, and they treat patients in ways that they wouldn't normally do it. Um, when, when you're at a mass casualty situation, and you, you can't say, I can treat every patient. So one of the first things you do in kind of a triage thing is say, okay, anybody that can get up and move, please move. And then you've eliminated the, the people that can take care of themselves to a certain extent. Um, so you take those kind of th concepts to a smart base and you start saying, okay, this information that's coming in, can I easily, like James, do I know you? If you're telling me something you're seeing, is this valid? Well, I, I have a good relationship with you, right? Right. So when I start looking at um, the sensors, and I start looking at stuff. So, <clears throat> is this data that's consistent with what I'm seeing, or is it an outlier? And, and if it's an outlier, why? So um, you, you see with some of the large telephone networks that are out there, they have heuristics that automatically respond to things. A circuit goes down, it fails over a certain way. And then humans come in later on and say, was this right or wrong? And you kind of develop a, a, a better algorithm for the way that it responds. And you're going to see that with smart cities. And it's not just, say, with um, cyber attacks, but it might be, with, I mean, traffic is an, an obvious one. When you saw I-85 get burnt last year, all the models are like, this is gonna be really bad. But the city of Atlanta, one of the, the really good things that they did, they brought in MARTA, they brought in DOT, they brought in Uber officials, they brought in everybody that had a, 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 you know, some kind of foot in the game that had to um, 
deal with this because it was going to be like that for a little while. And they said, how can we make it better? And some of the things were, you know, MARTA altered their, their travel pattern, but not the, the, the routes, but some of the timings and stuff. Uber started doing like, I think it was 50% if you had more than one person in the car, they were giving you discounts to double up and get traffic down. And then you saw employers saying, well, some people can work from home and we can alter some different times for people to come in. So it was kind of everybody looking at that. But that's really what a smart city is, right? Yeah, but that's, that, that's the, that example of Atlanta is a crisis situation, right? right? It's not necessarily a protocol. Yeah. Yeah, right. So the, the, what you would think, and I don't know what they're doing, but you know, in, in, in theory, what you do is a post-mortem, right? right? So when you're looking at a smart city, you, you, you have kind of three phases, okay? What has the history been and how should we do it? What do we have up and running? How can we attack things today? You know, what's just traffic like today? But then you sit down afterwards and say, okay, what were things, how could we have avoided this? You know, um, because I think, you know, you talked about earlier about how you can't write this as like, who would have thought that you could set a fire that would take down an interstate overpass? But it happened, you know. Well, a lot of a lot of stuff that we don't think can happen happen. We yeah. had that conversation kind of offline, yeah. right? Where you go, hey, you know, you hear stories and you go, well, is this right. really true? Right. But where does security play into all of that? I mean, well, at yeah. what point does security become part of cyber? Because in Dubai, for example, it was an afterthought. Right. Well, and you're so you're seeing, and this is actually really good to get back to the cyber stuff. You're seeing um, the the army. They've got the Cyber Center of Excellence at Fort Gordon. Right. Um, there's a cyber college at the Air University at Maxwell. Right. Um, I, I was visiting. There, there was a cyber strategy uh, uh, session last week. I visited with Patricia, introduced her to Dr. Pana, the dean of the college, and and one of the things that they're really talking about is, um, in in many cases. Cyber is an afterthought because there's so much legacy stuff out there. And so when you deploy resources, when you develop resources, when you purchase resources, cyber needs to be part of that conversation. And and the federal government's been asking for this for many years. But isn't that the challenge? I mean, when you look at legacy infrastructure projects, legacy infrastructure monopolies that are out there today, isn't that the challenge is that how do you really kind of beat cyber how do you forget cyber? How do you beat security into it, right? I mean, how do you protect? We saw this happen, you know, in October of I think it was 2016 when the East Coast lost internet for mm -hmm. half a day. I mean, you had everything from Boston down almost to South Carolina where they couldn't get online for, for yeah. some of those people. And I mean, that was a massive, you know, kind of oh, infrastructure mess. You, you see, the, the, the first time for me was, and I forget how long ago it was, but I was at an airport and I saw that BlackBerry had an outage. And at that point in time, you know, all of the federal government was basically using BlackBerry. Right. And the fact that a cell phone device has an outage is making national news. And this is like 20 years ago. I mean, it's just like, mm -hmm. holy cow. Um, so we, we become dependent upon that. But at, at some point in time, you also have to look and see... So cyber at the end of everything is all about physical, right? right. So are, are we able to protect our physical resources, assets, um, or project our physical assets in, in a way that, that gives us an advantage in the field? Um, when you look at things that the military is talking about, um, are you familiar with like the, the, the third offset where you use technology for an advantage? Can you speed up the tempo of the battle? Can you slow down the tempo of the battle? Can you control things until you can get to a place that you want to be? Um, and they look at things like what would happen if the networks were shut down? How would you operate without a network? Um, and, and the ways that you look at that is, well, maybe you have more than one network. You know, if you have multiple, we talked about integrated fire, we have multiple sources of data. The fact that somebody might take out a cellular network, um, but the Wi-Fi might still be there, or Bluetooth, or whatever. I mean, there's different ways you can get the data in there. Um, but then you also have heuristics that say, I'm disconnected from the network, what should I do? What is what does that look like? Um, and you know, you see things that are out there already where things when they're disconnected, an alarm goes off, right? It's a very simple concept, but it lets people know immediately something has changed and how do I do that? Um, looking at the different value of resources, you're gonna have different patterns of response for you know, say recreational resources that are out there. They would have one level of response to if you're responding to um, you know, some sort of security or hospital or SCIF where you've got, you know, uh, sensitive data, that would have a different algorithm. 
and, and you build all that in there. And, and that's, it's 24-7, always going on, and it's always going to be modified. Things are going to change because there's always bad guys looking for the little, I mean, what was the stuff with Intel? How long had that stuff been out there? Right. You know, years. And it's so, okay, well, now we have to act on it. And, you know, um, when you talk to people about 9-11, are they any safer on 9-11 than they were on 9-10? No. They're actually just the same. You're more aware of it. You weren't aware of it in 9-10. You were innocent. You were at home with your kids and stuff. You didn't think about it. But, you know, once you become aware of it, you have to act on it. You have to um, change the way you do things. Do you think we underestimate the value of security in some of the new technology we develop? Do you feel like that's compromised? I, I think... I don't know that I can say we underestimate it. I think that we're not always aware of some of the things. So um, it, it, when we talk to people who say they're experts in stuff, and then we've all met them, and as soon as they say, I'm an expert and everything's cyber, it's like, okay, find somebody else. Because you can't be an expert in every aspect of it. It is just such a fast-moving world. It is so wide and varied. And it's the same thing with wireless. Somebody says they're an expert in wireless. What well, part? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Do, you th- do you think the deployment, of, real quick, I'll switch you to wireless. Do you think the deployment of 5G is, 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 are we at the right time to deploy 5G? Is it safe enough? Is it stable enough? And can it handle it? The standards are still being developed. I think um, equipment is being rolled out. And you see companies um, looking and testing stuff out. I, I think the use cases in the business model, right, is the big thing because there's a lot of money being spent on it. I think at every step of the way, if you go from 1G to 2G, 3G to 4G, what you're really seeing is that wireless really becomes more embedded in the network, right? So um, earlier on, the data had to be manipulated before it hit the terrestrial network, or you might even have voice and data stuff separately. Well, now that it's all IP, um, you know, the, the towers are really being hardwired into the network. You're seeing it, it goes straight out of the air into the network. You know, I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but... You know, you're no, saying, it makes complete sense. I mean, when I worked at Verizon Wireless, I still, till today, I have that, I have a photographic memory. I have that sketch of how a wireless network right. works, right? Like the phone, the signal hitting the tower, then the tower. And the modulator sending, and the GGS right. and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was incredible. But what, you, what you're seeing right now is, you know, latency is going down, speeds are going up. You have um, uh, multi-carrier, so, you, you know... Um, you you have you know may have multiple antennas and radios on a phone or a device that can allow you to aggregate. I keep using the word aggregate, but it's really what data does is you can kind of pile it together and you, your speeds um, can become greater. So, you know, I, I talk about my kids a lot, but um, my very first job working for the phone company was upgrading to Windows 3.1, where we would go around <laughs> and just put. And there has was so, that floppy disk time? Yeah. And and there was so little memory. If if the the person that was in in they were they were doing the call center stuff, they would have to delete every game off the computer just so we could upgrade. Okay. Well, nowadays, what, what, what game? Snake. Solitaire. Yeah, it was like Minesweeper. Oregon Snake. Trail, yeah, yeah. What's that? Oregon Trail. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was a big one back then. But um, you know, it, it's but like nowadays, my kids will have an iPhone and. They'll not even think about downloading downloading several movies just in case they get bored, you know. Um, and, and it's like, so the the world is changing around us, right? So what's the capacity on your iPhone? Uh, I mean, mine has 128 gigabytes of data on it, and but then the model is changing as speeds get faster. We're right, and, the cloud, and, and so we don't need to store cloud, as much. Right, you don't need to store as much because you store it all on the cloud. I mean, the only time I'd not use the cloud is when I'm on airplane mode. Yeah. And, and my, my youngest daughter, she you know, will be in the car, and she's like, Dad, the Internet's not working. And I was like, well, you're in a car. You know? and in her world, the Internet is always there. She's like, Dad, <laughs> on a plane it works, on a car something, it doesn't? It. Something is wrong. You know? So when you're looking at uh, this kind of pervasive connectivity, you're just another node on the network. Uh, you know, the, net, the IT guys used to try to fight it, and then they would want to know who you were and what you were. And nowadays, they're more like... As long as you have an ID and a password, we'll give you a certain profile. So you've got, you know, what kind of level of threat are you based on how you come into the network? Do do you miss the days where there was no Wi-Fi in airplanes and you could legally disconnect? Uh, 
I, I think that people are incredibly rude, and I try to always have my phone on silent. I don't want to be that guy in church that the phone is ringing or that I'm on the plane talking to people. Um, every now and then I'll find something that my mother calls or somebody's in the hospital or whatever, and then I was like, okay, i got to go out. But um, I, I think there's a lot, of, not a lot of manners, so I do think that that's an issue. Um, I do look forward to you know when I'm on a plane that I can catch up on some things without right. having to be online at that minute. Um, but uh, you know, we've traded emails in the middle of the night, and, and I do that with my kids, and uh, it, it's just kind of a way of life. And it comes back to my old paramedic days. I worked you know 24 seven when I was on. That's. I used to travel a lot. I mean, in 2014. Very few planes had Wi-Fi. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, we're four years later, and now almost every single airplane you get on has Wi-Fi com- it's table connectivity. Sticks. It's table stakes, right? So, um, and, and when you're looking at, you know, like, going back to smart cities, one of the big things there is uh, do you have Wi-Fi in parks or college campuses or business campuses or on MARTA? in Atlanta or at the airport, um, it's become, you know, it used to be that you paid for it, and there are still some cases you pay for it, but most of the time it's free um, because everybody else has it. And it's becoming a basic necessity like electricity yeah. or water. You're seeing that negotiated. Uh, there was Clark Howard was talking about when you rent an apartment, talk about those kinds of things. It's a, a utility. When I um, rented this office we're in today, the one thing I never checked for was internet connection because I take it for granted, right? Yeah. Lo and behold, that I'm really uh, held hostage by only one company because the competitor can only give me DSL internet. And I haven't had DSL internet since about 2005, yeah. right? I mean, no one uses DSL anymore. It's cable. It's, right. it's fiber optics. It's, it's contended. So you deal with if you work in, if you work from home and you've got DSL and, and kids are out of school then you're going to be dealing with all of the kids playing their games and watching their videos and stuff. Right, but who, who in the world still uses DSL? I mean, who still Resident. sells it? Yeah. But who still sells it? I mean, I know, I know of one company that yeah. still sells it. They tried to sell it to me, and I was like, guys, I don't think I can afford to use DSL. Yeah, it does become a limiting factor. And, and you're seeing that with uh, you know, the 5G at some point in time when 5G launches our appetites will, I mean, our appetite has gone up so much over the past decade or so. But is 5G really more secure or outside of the speed factor, is is it more reliable than 4G? Is it more secure than 4G out of the box? Or is it, or is it going to be kind of one of those, it's new technology, we've invested money, we're deploying it, security comes second and everything else comes second to deployment. I'm not a certifying agency. But I can tell you that they're learning their lessons every step of the way. And from generation to generation, they've learned about what the problems were and what the issues were, and they look and see where their trajectories take them. So they attend to that. So if you look, if you're you know, involved with the bodies that uh, set the 5G standards, they're out there and they're actively working on it. They've got input from you know, most of the major telecoms and manufacturers and stuff that, that are saying, here's what we see. So it's it's a um, it's a work in progress. So I can't tell you day one. I, I think that there are trials out there that have been launched by several different carriers, and they seem to be aimed at different things, um, different solutions in, in, in different segments. Does five G play a big role in smart cities? I think it will. I, I, I think um, you're seeing much more pervasive connectivity um, in 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 a lot of the. And we didn't have that much of an issue at at, at Maxwell. Um, because there was an existing coverage, right. we had plenty of plenty of coverage out there. Um, but in some areas, in some cities, you can see, and and as you see, so like I've had recent conversations. I live in Cobb County. I've had recent conversations with Cobb County about stuff that they're doing. Um, it's relatively affluent area, but when you start looking at say some of the other areas in Georgia, a little more rural, a little bit more distant, their coverage is um, less. Now um, there's a new government agency called FirstNet that um, came out of 9-11 that is, is uh, working to have all public safety be interactive. And uh, so, you know, FirstNet is, is a government agency that's been put out there to f- oversee um, the building of this network and 
um, how public safety can benefit from that. But you're seeing a lot of that overlap into rural coverage, uh, into the cities, because if you've got a, a fire a truck or an ambulance or police car is going somewhere and you can control those lights to clear traffic out of the way, um, then that's a benefit to the city and it's a benefit to FirstNet. Um, so they're looking at ways that that can be integrated in kind of a holistic manner. Um, also part of that is getting that information out, letting people know what's going on. I mean, you see things like ways um, that can go out there and say there's a wreck or, or whatever. There's a cop waiting for you around the that, corner. Yeah, and, and, and that's an unintended benefit, right? So um, I don't know. I mean, when I started using Waze, the only reason I used it was for, 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 for the cop feature. Yeah. And I've kind of learned my lesson in that I think I'll know a way, and it'll say this way is faster, and I'll say, no, I'm going to go this way, <laughs> but there's a wreck there or there's something going on. Um, so a lot of times that data, you know, you, you, you know, statistics, they'll win in the end, right? You know, right. We, we might be able to win every now and then, but overall, they're going to be right. Yeah, um, I, I beat Waze the other day on my way to the office. I, I to always use Waze when I leave my house just to see which route it's going to give me in time. And this time it was telling me, oh, you, it had me going like two miles out of the way to get to my office. And I'm like, yeah. I'm not wow. driving eight miles for a five-mile drive. Right. No way. I was like, this way will still be faster. And, and it turned out to be much faster. Well, I mean, and a lot of times it depends on how current. Like, so if it, it could have been a wreck that was winding up and they pulled them off or whatever. But, you know, I do the same thing you do. My kids ask me, you know, you know the way home. Why do you have it on? It's like, because I get more information. Right. You know, if there's construction or if there's a wreck or something going on, and I can watch my time go up or down depending, you know, because 75 has had construction forever. Um, if you drive, is it ever going to stop? I don't. I, I mean, my, my wife is from Boston, so she t- talks about the big dig up there. So it's yeah, um, the, like Boston's been under construction since Boston was established. Yeah, yeah. and then mm-hmm. there's and, parts of Boston that are still under construction. And there'll be parts where she goes down there and she's like, I don't recognize this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know, it, it's the way it is, right? So having access, you know, one of the things you see is infrastructure is being built now. They can actually build infrastructure sensors into the roads. So um, you don't have to have these cables running across to monitor how much traffic goes on there. You don't have to have something externally put on to monitor stress. Um, you're seeing that with Atlanta where they've got the, 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 water, the water mains that break. If you have sensors on there that can kind of see, are we putting up more water than we should? Is there something that's different than normal? Maybe we should check a look at this before it collapses the road. Preventative. And, um, you know, in, in bases, in many cases, are, are very much the same. You've, you've got a population that has, is a self-contained, uh, you know, it, it's not as open as, say, as a city like Atlanta, but you've got restaurants and schools and mechanic shops and, you know, police, fire, EMS. Um, you've got administration that runs it. So a lot of the problems that they have, maybe on a smaller scale, are, are very much the same. I think this discussion can keep going on. I want to be mindful of your time um, and also our listeners. Where are we at? Anyways, oh, wow. 41. Okay. 41 and then three before. So, all right, cool. So, Paul, thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. I enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. And we're going to be um, right back after this brief message. Hey guys, and we're back, and I want to thank Mr. Paul for words for joining me in our studio today here at the Cyber Hub Engage podcast. Um, like every episode, a conversation could have gone on forever, and one day maybe I'll make it like Tim Ferriss and be able to do a two, three hour podcast and have you know hundreds of thousands of listeners. Until then, please share, follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Cyber Hub Engage. Tune in. I want to thank our sponsor, Cyber Hub Academy. I want to thank Paul. Uh, for joining me today. And I want to thank Micah Smith, who's our technical director. And with that being said, stay tuned next week. I got a really special guest coming. So follow us on Twitter and make sure to get the first updates. Thanks for tuning in. This is the Cyber Hub Engage podcast.